الرحمن علم القرآن خلق الإنسان علمه البيان الشمس والقمر بحسبان والنجم والشجر يسجدان Assalamu alaikum my friends welcome to another episode of the Revelation Experience I'm Miraj Mohideen today we are going to be talking about Surah Al-Shams this is the 91st surah in the compiled order it is an early Meccan surah of course we're going through a lot of the early Meccan surahs right now and this surah it's a very beautiful surah you know one of the things that is unique about Surah Al-Shams is its rhyming pattern it sounds different than a lot of the other surahs that uh, you have been listening to so far you know most I would probably imagine the most common uh, letter that ends every verse in the Quran, or most verses in the Quran, is the letter noon, right? Because of the way Arabic grammar is and syntax, right? Muslimun, uh, uh, ya'malun, uh, you know, so you have a lot of noons ending. This is this surah is different. It rhymes in a different way, and it's very pretty in the way it rhymes because you get a different flavor of how. Uh, the Quran can sound. For those of you who are not familiar with the Quran, who have never really listened to the Quran, you know, this is a surah I would definitely recommend you listen to. You can go to, you know, Hassan's uh, YouTube channel and take a listen to that also. I will play it here as well. Um, and you can get a feel for how the Quran is so beautiful in its rhyming scheme, even though it has different kind of uh, endings to the, each verses, they're consistent, and it's very beautiful in that way. So, in fact, why don't we just take a listen to the uh, first part of the surah right now, so you can get a sense of that rhyming scheme. والشمس وضحاها والقمر إذا تلاها والنهار إذا جلاها والليل إذا يغشاها والسماء وما بناها So the surah begins والشمس وضحاها So والشمس, شمس is the word for sun and that's where the surah gets its name by the sun and its radiance and by the moon as it trails along. So again, we see al-shams and al-qamar. And that's what you hear in the first few verses. Then Allah, after swearing by those two, He swears by the day as it brightens. And that's nahar. So you'll hear, nahari. So as a day as it brightens. And then He swears by the night as it covers up. Walayli. Then Allah swears by the sky, sama is sky. Then he swears by the earth and its wide expanse, ard. So Allah is swearing by, how many things he swore by? He swore by the ashams, one, al-qamar, two, an-nahar, daylight, three, al-layl is number four, as-sama, sky, is number five, al-ard is number six. وَالشَّمْسِ وَضُحَاهَا وَالْقَمَرِ إِذَا تَلَاهَا وَالنَّهَارِ إِذَا جَلَّاهَا وَاللَّيْلِ إِذَا يَغْشَاهَا وَالسَّمَاءِ وَمَا بَنَاهَا وَالْأَرْضِ وَمَا طَحَاهَا So he's sworn by six things. These are all things that are outside of us, right? The sun, the moon, the day, the night, the sky, the earth. Allah is swearing by things that we can see in nature around us and like big things, right? What's bigger than the sky? What's bigger than the sun? And then we talk about the moon and then nightfall. And these are huge signs that Allah is swearing by. Now, after all of those huge signs, Allah now swears by another huge sign. But this sign now is not external to us. This is a sign that is internal to us. When Allah says, وَنَفْسٍ وَمَا سَوَّاهَا By the Nafs, or the, you know, that's a difficult word to translate. It's translated here as the soul and how he has created it so balanced, right? Everything Allah has created has been perfect. Everything is in perfect balance. It is that divine balance and perfection that Allah creates everything. And he then, in the next verse, goes on to describe what does he mean by that balance? He's saying it's innate awareness of right and wrong. Right? It's capacity to understand good and bad, wickedness and righteousness. We were all been given this. Now, after all that, 
right? We just talked about seven things, huge signs that Allah has sworn by. What is, what is the statement now? Right? Remember in the previous surah, we talked about Surah Al-Qadr, right? If we're going in the chronological order, and Allah is saying, وَمَا أَدْرَاكَمُ Al-Qadr. He swears by Al-Qadr, and then He says, وَمَا أَدْرَاكَمُ Al-Qadr. You know, this is something big. And what would help you understand how big that is? It's a way of calling attention to what's about to come up after that. Well, and this, another way to do that is to swear by a bunch of things, right? It's like, you know, in, in just like everyday parlance, when someone's like, you know, I swear on my mother's grave. That's like something, you know, people in the West would say, you know, I swear on my, my, my father's honor. Right? You're swearing by things which are considered holy and sacred and big, and you would never go against that, et cetera, et cetera. Well, in the same way, in a similar tone, Allah is swearing by these great things that we can all can see and witness, and then he is swearing by the soul itself, which tells us that is something also very great. Now, all of that preamble, what was Allah swearing to? What is he about to say? This is kind of like the big takeaway. And this is where we're getting into like the heart of what I understand to be Islam. This is the kind of, these are the verses that really help me figure out the real keys to unlock in the Quran. And I'm not saying I did this on my own, by no means. This is, you know, listening to teachers, learning from people who understand Quran, who understand the Arabic and so forth. What is the next verse? قَدْ أَفْلَحَ مَنْ زَكَّاهَا قَدْ أَفْلَحَ مَنْ زَكَّاهَا Successful is he who purifies it, meaning the soul. Right? قَدْ قَدْ is like, you know, indeed, certainly. أَفْلَحَ أَفْلَحَ is success, right? We hear that all the time when we, when we listen to the Adhan. We say, حَيَا لَلْفَلَا It's the same root word as right here, aflaha, successful, is he who purifies it, zakkaha, as opposed to, in the next verse, Allah says, وَقَدْ خَابَ مَنْ دَسَّاهَا So, successful is a person who has purified his soul, and the unsuccessful person, the person who has failed, is the one who buries his soul. He covers it up. He corrupts his soul. So that's basically it. Allah has sworn by these seven huge things and now saying, well, what is success? Success is the one who purifies his soul. Now, this is really interesting because this, you know, when I was writing Revelation, again, I came from a different understanding than where I've arrived today on my journey. We are all on journeys. You guys are on a journey also. But a lot of uh, what I came, when I began writing Revelation, and you know, for those of you who haven't heard my story before or not, you know, I approached it as initially as a medical student who wanted to learn my religion the way I had learned microbiology and immunology and so forth. I wanted to master this material, and I had this very academic approach to studying the Quran and the life of the Prophet Muhammad, peace upon him. The thing is, as I got further and further into it, years and years and years into it, what I realized is that this journey of becoming a Muslim, this journey of coming close to Allah, this journey of understanding the Qur'an, it's really hard to read the Qur'an completely with an open heart and not see the core of this message, which is in these verses like this, where Allah is saying, successful is the one who purifies his soul. Allah is not saying successful is the person who prayed all night in a night that's better than a thousand months, right? Allah, yes, He is telling us that in the previous surah, Layl al Qadr, it is good. It is a night of power. There's a lot of blessing in that. And yes, you should, you know, we understand from the, from the example of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, it is good to stay up that night on, on those nights, the last nights of Ramadan. We understand the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, stayed up every night in the last 10 nights of Ramadan. Connecting with Allah, speaking with Allah, conversing with Allah, getting to know Allah, opening himself up to Allah. The relationship gets deeper, right? So that's, that's important. But I'm not aware in the Quran where Allah is saying, successful is a person who stays up all night and prays. Now, why not? Well, I mean, just use your own intuition for a second, right? If you were an Olympic coach who had athletes, you wouldn't say... I guarantee an Olympic medal for anyone who does 100 sets of push-ups. 
Because if that's the case, everyone could just go home, start doing push-ups, get up to 100 sets, and then win. Right? But push-ups are a mechanical thing. You don't know if everyone's doing it with good form. You don't know if people are really into it when they're doing the push-ups. You don't know if they're cheating and they're putting their knees on the ground when they're doing push-ups. You don't know if they're actually going all the way down and all the way up. So you don't know the quality of those push-ups. So just to say, oh, you will get a gold medal if you do 1,000 push-ups, that doesn't really, or 100 push-ups or whatever, uh, you wouldn't say that as a coach, right? Because you can't guarantee that because you don't know the quality of the effort that people are putting in and so forth. And that one act might not actually translate into becoming um, a better runner, or a better pole vaulter or whatever, right? It might not be as translatable. It is good. Doing a thousand push-ups is good for you. You'll probably be stronger for it. But is that true success of getting a gold medal? No. So the, as a coach, as an Olympic coach, I would say to athletes, the successful person who gets a gold medal is a person who has the best fitness, whose body is in the best of shape with strength, flexibility, endurance, uh, breathing capacity, whatever it is, all of these things, these are things that make up the entire uh, athlete. And say, like whoever has the best of that, they will be the best runner or the best this or the best that. So what we're not talking about is not a metric, an external metric, hey, can you do a thousand push-ups? No, it's whoever can transform their body to have the strongest heart with the most powerful breathing and you know, the, the, the strongest legs, that person will be the fastest sprinter. Okay, we're talking about something deeper and more internalized than an external metric. And so what you see is Allah is swearing by this also. And he's saying, saying, the successful person is the one who purifies his soul. And for me, when I started really unlocking this, I realized that this deen, this religion is really a religion of purification. Tazkiyah, tazkiyah means purification, which is the same root word as this word right here. قَدْ أَفْلَهَا مَنْ زَكَّاهَا زَكَّاهَا تَزْكِيَا And so for me, in my personal journey, what started as kind of like a academic, intellectual exercise, slowly, whether I liked it or not, started going more and more inward, away from just the mind only and down to the heart, right? Down to the soul, the nafs purifying the soul and if this is pure then whatever comes out of the heart wherever the heart pumps out to those the manifestations of that will be pure someone who has a pure heart will want to stay up all night to converse with their lord again let's go back to relationships if you know just to make it tangible again if you truly love someone okay let's talk about human relationships if you fall in love with someone you will naturally, whether you plan to or not, you might call them at 8 o'clock at night. It's very easy for you to stay up all night on the phone with that person, talking to them, because you just like their presence. You want to hear their voice, and you just want to share your life with them. You didn't plan that, right? So it's a natural manifestation that if you love someone, you, you, whether you plan it or not, you stay up all night talking to them. But conversely... Forcing yourself to stay up all night to talk to someone doesn't necessarily mean that you're in love with them. You can force yourself to do it. You might not even enjoy it. You might be tired. You might have to drink coffee to do it and so forth. But the latter, right, the external manifestation doesn't necessarily guarantee an inward state. Now, I'm not saying that the external manifestation can't help create an inward state. And that's why we understand this is what the coaching is of the prophet's life, peace upon him, is that sometimes we have to get into the habit of doing things. So that doesn't mean, oh, you don't pray five times a day until you actually feel the strong desire to constantly call Allah five times a day. No, there's certain things you have to entrain your body to do. And we know even through, you know, sports and, you know, human cognition and so forth, you can train your inner state by creating habits of your external environment, Right. So they work back and forth in both ways. But the reality is that the true, the true motivation has to come from within at some point. Along the way, you can train yourself to do it. Like fasting, for example. Fasting is hard for most people when they begin. It's, you know, and most people who are not familiar with fasting are like, oh my gosh, you fast for 30 days? And you know, I remember when I was a kid, fasting, it was more like a badge of honor. I did it. I made it. But it wasn't like I was getting these huge spiritual breakthroughs with it. My family was doing it as a cultural thing. We did it. I enjoyed it. Ramadan was fun. As I get older, it's starting to dawn on me the sweetness of fasting, 
right? So here's a situation where I did the external first and the internal was lagging. But there comes this inflection point where the internal starts catching up with the external, hopefully overtaking it, so that you get to a point in your life where fasting in Ramadan is not only this experience that you wish you could share with other people because it's so beautiful for you, you actually start fasting outside of Ramadan because now you're intrinsically motivated. You actually are getting something out of it. And so what you see here, again, not to go into too much detail on this, but to understand the role of the manifestations, the acts of piety, as opposed to piety that comes from the soul. And again, we have to do, we have to balance both. But remember, true motivation, true success, right? People will tell you in motivation psychology. The people who are truly successful at what they do are people who are motivated for some inner cause, not because they're getting credit, not because they're getting a uh, degree in something, not because they are getting paid for something. It's because they truly love what they do. They truly love sharing their passion with the world. These are the people who tend to be the most successful. I mean, if you just look at artists, right, classic Renaissance artists, many of them were broke. They didn't make all this money in their lifetime. They just loved what they did. And then later on, people recognize, wow, this is really good artwork. You know, as one very simple example, there are a lot, maybe better examples, but that was just off the top of my head. So again, not to belabor this point too much, but this has been my discovery. And I'm just sharing you my personal discovery. You're free to discover for yourselves. It's more powerful if you discover it for yourselves. So my personal discovery is at the heart of Islam is tazkiyat nafs which is exactly what this surah, Allah just sweared by six things to back this up. So I feel pretty confident saying that myself. At the heart of Islam, قَدْ أَفْلَهَا مَنْ زَكَّاهَا Okay. Successful is he who purifies it. Now, just to back this claim up more, and we talked about extrinsic motivation, intrinsic motivation. We talked about purifying the inner as opposed to just performing the external manifestations. I want to point you to another surah, right? We already covered Surah Al-A'la, if you're going in the order, the chronological order, and in that we had already heard the verse, قَدْ أَفْلَحَ مَنْ تَزَكَّى قَدْ أَفْلَحَ مَنْ تَزَكَّى He has certainly succeeded who purifies himself. So again, twice, we're hearing almost the exact same verse in the early Meccan period, talking about this importance of tying success to purification of the self. So all of these things here, guys, and this is, again, so important because we're talking about transformation. This is a course or a series on transformation. Transformation comes from the inside out. It goes back to the first talk that I gave you about the three circles. The inner circle is why, the next circle is how, and the outer circle is what. You will see throughout the Quran that when Allah talks about success and like actually coming closer to him, it's based on the wise, right? The core, the inner, the soul, not the manifestations and the extremes, what your hands and your feet did. That's important, but that's just an indication of what's coming deeper down that's influencing your behaviors. So um, I just wanted to just throw that in there because I just think this is a very important point that, you know, I never really heard of the word tazkiyah uh, growing up. Uh, necessarily in the community and so forth, where people are talking about the importance of purification of the soul. In Sunday schools, I don't know that that is really spent, a lot of time is spent on what does it mean to purify your soul? What does it mean to have good character, to fulfill your trust? What does it mean to, to have a kind word for people, to never say bad things about people? You know, when I look at it, I feel like that is what Islamic education should be premised on. Not necessarily just starting into, you know, you have to do this and you have to do this and don't do this and don't do that. That's starting with the outside in. We are starting from the inside out. And so I feel, as you can imagine, as you can tell, I feel very strongly about this because I think it just, it just, um, it bores people with religion. You're overwhelming them with what's before you explain how and why. So you're not inspiring people. And when people don't know the reasons why they do things, after a while, those rituals, they lack meaning. They become perfunctory. They become, you know, um, mechanical. They can become boring. And then they become hard to follow through on because they're boring with no meaning. There's no benefit from them necessarily that people are feeling. And then they fall away. And then we wonder why, oh, the youth aren't interested in Islam. The youth don't want to come to the masjid. Or people who were practicing are drifting away. Or our, us ourselves. I mean, I felt this myself, personally. When I'm not in it to win it, when it's not coming from the inside out, it becomes very hard or it becomes much more boring or much more challenging to maintain the basics than when I'm feeling inspired by my deen, when I'm feeling that I have this powerful relationship with Allah. There is some level of khushua, even maybe once a year, not every night, not every day necessarily, 
That's when, that's how we maintain our communities and inspire the people around us. So having said all of that, now the surah now turns. We've just gotten basically, this is like a basics Quran 101 in the first 10 verses. The second 10 verses now, Allah is talking specifically about an interesting event to the people of Thamud. Remember, we talked about Ahd and Thamud. These were that category, the first category of Arabs. I think we covered in, in, in the second talk, which is the perished Arabs. They no longer exist. They were these Arabs who lived in these places in uh, Arabia, in the Arabian Peninsula. Thamud is a little bit north of Ad, And they perished. Why did they perish? Because they disobeyed the prophets. They disobeyed Allah's message. This is a warning to the Quraysh. Because Allah says here, the people of Thamud rejected the truth, right? This truth that the messenger was sending them in their audacity. The worst man among them rose up, right? And when it says rose up, what did he rise up to do? He rose up to do an evil deed, which we'll hear here in a second. Now, background. In the next verse, Allah says, their messenger of God had told them, this camel belongs to God, so let her drink at the wells. Who is this messenger Allah is referring to? Remember, guys, in our mnemonics, right? I said Ad was the, the, the southern uh, peoples and Thamud was the northern peoples. And then I told you that an easy mnemonic to remember them was Ad is one syllable, its prophet is one syllable, which is Hud alayhi salam. One syllable, Ad, Hud, right? And then Thamud, two syllables, his prophet, their prophet was Salih alayhi salam. So, Interesting about these two prophets. See, you'll hear Ad and Thamud mentioned a lot, often together in the same sentence, right? One of the things you have to realize is that the vast majority of prophets mentioned in the Quran were Hebrew prophets. So they didn't, they were not in Arabia. These are prophets in, you know, Philistine, right? This is in Jerusalem and around Jerusalem and so forth. There are stories of them in, in Egypt and whatnot. But these are further north. Interesting about Hud salam and Saleh, these are Arab prophets. They lived closer, much closer to the Quraysh. So in a way, you could say their reality was a much closer, stark reality. Okay? And just like, you know, as you can imagine, even in your own lives, right? If you look at, uh, you know, let's use a pandemic, because that's the easiest thing to, for everyone to recognize, right? When a pandemic is happening across the world, and you're just like, oh, well, that's happening over there. It doesn't like kind of rush you into action and get ready. Oh, my gosh, what if this comes close to home? But once you see that pandemic happening in cities near you or in countries near you, all of a sudden it kind of raises the, the alert level because this is coming close to home. And so in that way, Ad and Thamud are mentioned so often in the Quran. So Allah is now talking about the people of Thamud who rejected their prophet, who told them something specific. And what did he tell them? He said, this camel belongs to God, so let her drink at the wells. Now the backstory on this is that as Salih was having a difficult time with his people of Thamud, they were not buying into his message. Surprise, surprise, right? This is what's happened to every single messenger. And so a sign that Salih showed them was this one specific camel, and we'll get into this in other um, stories. I don't want to go too deep into this because there are other surahs which will get deeper into the story of Saleh and Thamud. But in this, he tells them, just lay off this camel. This is a specific sign from Allah. Let this camel drink wherever she wants. Okay? This is a simple test to the people. And remember, this is coming down when the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him, is in the early Meccan period getting heat from the Quraysh. This is why understanding this, the Quran is revealed order starts making sense. Right, this came down in Medina, it wouldn't have that feeling of import if you didn't know if this was a Meccan surah or a Medina surah. This is a Meccan surah and an early Meccan surah. So the Quraysh are hearing this. There is a people down the street from you who did the same thing to their prophet. Now what happened? What did these people do? Well, Allah goes back to this person, this worst man from amongst them. So in the next verse it says, these people of Thamud, they called him an imposter. They denied him. فَكَذَّبُوا And this word you hear a lot in the Qur'an, kadiba, right? Kadiba is like often translated as like, you know, those who deny or those who lie. They denied him. فَكَذَّبُوهُ Denied who? Denied Prophet Saleh, alayhi salam. They denied him. And now this wicked man who was mentioned in the previous verse, he cruelly maimed the camel, right? Hamstrung her. It's a common word that's used to describe this. He hamstrung her. Hamstrung means to, you know, you would 
you know, if you've seen this, you, you, know, you would cut the tendons of the animal's legs behind the knee so that, like, its hamstring muscle, it wouldn't be able to contract. So the animal would collapse. It's, like, a very cruel way, cruel thing to do, right? In his arrogance, here, Saul did something, just leave it alone. Let it drink. And not only do they not leave it alone or, not, or pen it up, this man, the most arrogant amongst them, he goes up to the camel and just kind of cuts her down. And that was a test from Allah to these people. And when he did that, what was the f- repercussion of that action? We hear this in the last few lines. Allah annihilated all of them for the crime. Allah did not annihilate that one man. Allah annihilated the entire community of people. Because this man was just a representative of those people, right? He wouldn't have done that if he didn't know he had the support of his society. Allah destroyed that entire society. And then very powerfully, as if that is not enough, Allah ends the surah by saying, وَلَا يَقَافُ أُقْبَاهَا Again, khawf, from the word of khawf and fear. وَلَا يَقَافُ And he does not fear. Who? Allah does not fear the consequences of what he just did to these people. كَذَّبَتْ ثَمُودُ بِطَغْوَاهَا إِذٍ بَعْثَ أَشْقَاهَا فَقَالَ لَهُمْ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ نَاقَةَ اللَّهِ وَسُقِيَاهَا فَكَذَّبُوهُ فَعَقَرُوهَا فَدَمْدَمَ عَلَيْهِمْ رَبُّهُمْ بِذَنْبِهِمْ فَسَوَّاهَا وَلَا يَخَافُ عُقْبَاهَا Now imagine the Prophet saying this to the people of Quraysh. There was a man, just like you Arabs, there was another Arab tribe, no different. An Arab Prophet came to them, he was Salih. I am Muhammad, this is the implication. Their society was against this man, and one of the nastiest of them. You know, it's like, imagine he's like speaking, referring to someone like Abu Jahl. One of the nasties among them came and not only opposed the messenger and covered up, denied the message, they attacked the signs that this messenger came with, in this example, the camel. When they did that, Allah destroyed the entire city of Thamud, such that Allah could destroy the entire city of Mecca also. Allah destroyed the entire city, and he has no fear of the consequences of what he did to those people. So don't think for a second that Allah does not fear repeating that to the Meccans here. That's the implication. Right? And so in many ways, this is a warning not only to the society at large, but a warning to those who were the nastiest, to the Prophet Muhammad, peace upon him, the ones who were trying to kill him, the ones who were trying to deny him, the ones who were ta- tra- calling him crazy and so forth. So very powerful Meccan surah. It sets up what does it mean to be a Muslim, honestly and truthfully, to be successful in Allah's eyes. What do we have to do? And we'll, hopefully we'll have more conversation about this idea of tazkiyat al-nafs, purifying the soul. But Allah is, tell, Allah is telling us this is the core of success as a Muslim. It's about our behavior and our actions, but it has to emanate from a pure heart, right? A pure nafs. And then we talked about the fact that if you go against the messengers, O Quraysh, I have a little foreshadowing of you of what might happen to you. And trust me, Allah is not at all scared of the consequences of his actions. So put that all together. This is the power of Meccan surahs. Short surahs, beautifully rhythmic. But if you don't understand the verses of it, you might say, oh, it's got a beautiful sound to it. You know, it's got this beautiful rhyming scheme and it's light on the tongue. But if you don't dive into the meanings, it's just this light, airy, beautiful surah. You're not recognizing, wow, this surah is packed with meaning, with guidance, and also with a very stern warning to the people who are denying the message of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. So that wraps up this surah. This was a little bit longer than I anticipated, but uh, hopefully, hopefully, uh, uh, that worked for you guys. I know some of the other surahs in this section are pretty short, so hopefully that balances it out. Until the next episode, I will see you guys soon, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum. <laughs> أصحاب الجنة خالدين فيها خالدين فيها جزاء بما كانوا يعملون